Um, so thanks again for the introduction. Uh, my topic is social stress in adolescence, uh, a longitudinal study in male mice. And I'll add a little side note or a uh, kind of a subtitle, if you like, uh, clarifying that I'm gonna focus on the concept of resilience. Um, so we can think of resilience in terms of what happens to whom. And this is the idea of uh, gene times environment interaction that was already touched upon in uh, the talks that we heard so far. Namely, the idea that uh, only certain individuals exposed to adverse life events will develop mental disorders, while others, despite the similar negative experience, uh, will remain uh, healthy. We can extend this definition of resilience or this uh, conceptualization of resilience, thinking about uh, what happens to who and when, namely speaking about critical periods of development. We know that a lot of mental disorders, not all of them, but a lot of mental disorders uh, have uh, their onsets uh, during uh, early childhood and or specifically the adolescent years. And part of the reason for this is that the brain is not uh, a homogenous blob. It's uh, uh, comprised of many circuits and brain areas that develop at a different uh, rate. And specifically the prefrontal cortex is one of the areas in you know, humans and other mammals that develops uh, last in the brain. And this protracted development takes many different forms, but uh, including uh, what you see here, seminal study by Goktai showing uh, protracted uh, pruning in the prefrontal cortex. Um, but also um, the dopaminergic projection to the prefrontal cortex, which is part of the mesocortical limbic dopamine system, is still under active development with increasing prefrontal cortex dopamine fibers within the PFC during adolescence and into early adulthood. And not coincidentally, a lot of the psychiatric disorders that are uh, characterized by adolescent onset are also characterized by prefrontal cortex dopamine dysfunction and cognitive impairments. So this is just to think of the different perspectives that we can take on resilience, which was kind of a step into the rest of my talk. Uh, we can model uh, adverse life experiences in animals, including social stress, and kind of the go-to model uh, at the moment, we could argue, is the social defeat stress model in mice. Uh, this is the role model of social stress. I'm gonna go over the idea very briefly in the interest of time. And the main idea behind is that, well, uh, mice are territorial. And if um, a mouse is introduced into the territory of another one, the uh, kind of the resident mouse will defend this territory by attacking the intruder mouse physically. And we can, con we can uh, create a control situation where an experimental mouse, um, let's see if I have my, an experimental mouse uh, is introduced into uh, the cage of a uh, larger mouse of a different strain to be repeatedly physically attacked and submitted over several uh, sessions of uh, social defeat. And after this procedure, we can uh, quantify kind of the, the social interaction of uh, mice exposed to this type of social stress or control mice that were uh, handled and housed similarly, but not exposed to social stress. We do this by uh, uh, the social interaction test, which consists of placing a controlling experimental mice in an uh, open field, which is initially empty, and we measure the uh, time they spend in the highlighted areas. And then we introduce uh, a mouse that is of the same strain as the aggressor mice, but is unfamiliar, so it wasn't part of the stressful experience to measure the time spent in the different uh, highlighted zones once again. And then we take the ratio of the time spent with or without the social target. What we see um, normally in, in uh, th these conditions is that control mice will have uh, interaction ratio higher than one, signifying that they spend more time when the social target is present. And defeat mice will break down into two groups those that will avoid the social targets, um, supposedly based on their negative uh, experience with a similar social target, but also those that despite the negative experience uh, will behave in this test similar to controls. That is what we define as resilient, it kind of like goes along with what uh, uh, the way I conceptualized resilience in the beginning. Now we can do this a paradigm in adolescence. Um, 
And then we can see something interesting because now we are targeting a social stress to a uh, vulnerable or less resilient period of life. And we can observe how uh, and if this uh, negative experience can have an impact on um, vulnerable circuitries in the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex dopamine um, projection and behaviors that are associated with it. To this end, we use a cognitive task to assess behavior depending on the prefrontal cortex uh, in adulthood. And the task consists of uh, placing uh, the experimental mouse or the control accordingly into an operant chamber where it has the opportunity to respond into two nose poke holes. And we train it to respond on, first of all, go trials where responding on an illuminated nose poke hole uh, by a nose poke leads to a delivery, delivery of a reward. And then we introduce on 50% of occasions a no-go trial where the, the light is now paired with a tone and the mouse has to withhold its response in order to receive a reward. If it doesn't, we consider that a commission error, which is a certain type of uh, impulsivity or represents lack of inhibitory control. What we find in this paradigm is that both resilient and susceptible mice, so all defeat mice, uh, have a um, high level of commission errors over days, meaning that they are cognitively impaired despite their resilient phenotype uh, in adolescence. And this uh, adult cognitive phenotype is associated with changes in prefrontal cortex, dopamine innervations such that resilient mice have uh, higher volume occupied by dopamine fibers and susceptible mice have a uh, higher number of uh, TH positive varicosities or dopamine release sites on dopamine axons. And I think this is a very interesting finding because uh, we have a resilient phenotype as defined from one perspective that is, uh, and in, in one domain in social behavior, and that is despite the negative social experience, these mice are still socially interacting, but at the same time, uh, much longer after the negative experience in adulthood, both resilient and susceptible mice show uh, a cognitive impairment or susceptibility to the negative uh, cognitive effects of uh, social stress in adolescence. So this made me think of, okay, how can we perhaps expand our view on, on, on these resilient, uh, so-called in, in quotation marks, mice? What will happen if we uh, take a closer look on their social behavior and look at it uh, uh, across time? To do this, uh, we used uh, some additional uh, behavioral tests, including the three chamber social preference test in which a uh, experimental mouse is placed in one of three chambers and given the opportunity to spend time either with an object or a conspecific that is age and uh, uh, strain matched. We also use a dark light test, which is a common measure of uh, anxiety like behavior in mice, which gives the mice the choice to spend time either in an enclosed dark uh, compartment in a cage or a brightly lit uh, compartment and more time spent in the brightly lit compartment uh, is indicative of uh, less anxious phenotype and finally um, I was interested in what could be the mechanism by which um, uh, the changes in the prefrontal cortex dopamine innovation we see might be driving potentially uh, this cognitive impairment uh, in mice stress in adolescence. To this end, we use the miniscope, uh, which is a calcium imaging technique that can observe activity uh, or calcium transients in individual neurons in the PFC. And then we designed a longitudinal study, which is kind of like a, the topic of my talk, uh, to see how these behaviors change over time. So we received our mice at postnatal day 21, which we consider like the beginning of early adolescence. Uh, which uh, we know from previous work is kind of the critical period for uh, prefrontal cortex dopamine development. We pre-screened the mice on the social preference test and the dark light test. Uh, then we exposed them to social defeat stress uh, within early adolescence. Immediately after social defeat uh, stress sessions, we test them on the social interaction test, which I described earlier, and then retested them on social preference, now following the stress exposure in adolescence. Then we let them grow for a month until they reach uh, adulthood, postnatal day 60, when again, I retest them on the social interaction test and the social preference test to uh, ultimately implant them with miniscopes uh, 
and record uh, calcium activity during go no go uh, training and the task itself. So here are the findings. Uh, first, I'm, uh, I'm gonna go uh, with the social interaction test because this is kind of like the, the, mm, the uh, status quo of, of defining resilience within this paradigm. And in adolescence, uh, we get the classic resilient uh, phenotype with a subset of mice susceptible, but we have to think that resilient susceptible is kind of two sides of the same coin. Susceptible mice that spend less time interacting with the social target in the social interaction test. But this phenotype disappears by adulthood, by, so by postnatal day 60 within a month. Then the social preference test, uh, something interesting we find is that before the stress exposure, the resilient group uh, has in fact lower social preference. They spend less time interacting with the social target uh, than uh, the control and susceptible mice. And following the uh, social stress, they spend more time interacting with the social target, suggesting that specifically in the resilient group, we have a distinct social preference profile uh, across time. And uh, this is reflected in, in a negative correlation between social interaction and social preference, such that uh, uh, lower social preference before stress predicts higher social interaction after the stress exposure. And finally, the dark light test, the pre-screening test, revealed also somewhat uh, surprising, you might say, finding that um, more anxious mice, so mice that spend less time uh, in the light compartment of the test, tended to interact more in the social interaction test following, uh, following exposure to um, social stress. And finally, uh, in the go no go task, I decided to take a slightly different approach to analyzing it because it's more data driven. And I wanted to kind of step aside from uh, the distinction of res resilient and susceptible to begin with. So I used a cluster analysis, which basically takes into account all mice taken together, regardless of controls or stressed, and looks at their performance on both go and no go trials and classifies them based on similarity. So, this analysis will create groups that perform similarly on the go and no go task. And using this analysis, I get uh, two groups. One of them is what I call the active solvers, which maintain high correct response rates on go trials in which they're well trained. But also, as soon as we uh, introduce the no-go trials, they gradually reduce their uh, commission errors, suggesting that they improve on the task. So they, they are kind of doing what they're supposed to be doing in solving the task. And I also get another group that seems to be doing really well on no-go trials, but upon closer look, it's revealed that they are in fact uh, kind of cheating or using a different strategy by simply not responding uh, a lot on trials. And this results them in them receiving rewards for no-go trials where they're supposed to withhold response, but also uh, reducing greatly their uh, rewards in go trials. This is what I call the passive solvers of the task. But if you look at the overall uh, reward rate, uh, you see that active solvers are more effective in getting more rewards. So kind of active solving is a more um, successful strategy. And while we find that the small proportion of animals in the active solvers are resilient, the highest, the highest proportion of uh, animals in the passive solvers are the resilient group, suggesting once again that in, at least cognitively, this definition of resilience based on the social interaction test solely at one point in time, this one test, perhaps does not extend to uh, the cognitive domain of, uh, of things. And finally, the, the Miniscope data is showing that uh, active and passive solvers have different profile of uh, neural responses in the PFC with the neural response in passive solvers uh, having uh, a, a delayed peak and also a um, uh, decrease from day one to day 19, which is not seen uh, in active solvers. So I'll summarize my talk here. We can think of resilience in terms of uh, what happens to who and when, but hopefully I also managed to convince you that you should also think about uh, how resilience is manifested once uh, it is observed in those terms. 
because uh, I showed you that resilient mice in the social interaction test have lower social preference and higher anxiety before stress exposure, and are more likely to adopt a less effective cognitive strategy during the vulnerable task, which uh, we could argue is perhaps not what we would expect of a resilient or the connotations of a resilient phenotype. And to kind of end my talk on a positive note, I want to again uh, stress the fact that resilience and susceptibility are kind of the two sides of the same coin. So if we can sometimes misclassify resilience because we have not uh, examined it well enough, perhaps the same applies for susceptibility. This is where I ended by saying thank you to uh, my whole lab for without whom I couldn't have done any of this uh, by myself, our funders, and last but not least to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip, for this very interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? I think we have time for one. We're a little bit late, but I think we would have time for at least one question. No? Okay, Malar. So I always wonder about this idea of resilience versus susceptibility because um, you know, the idea that you have to dichotomize your your behaviors in some way. You know, why, why do it that way? Why not try to create some sort of spectrum-based approach or some sort of continuous approach? You have the measures for it, right? They're all, you know, continuous measures. So why, why dichotomize them in some way other than for convenience? Because the worry I have is that, you know, the way you dichotomize them up front is that uh, you create a threshold based on some sort of social behavior, and then you say, oh, look, they're different based on the social behavior. I I dichotomize them on. So why not go the other way and actually use all your data to your advantage? Well, that, that is, yes, that is precisely the point I was trying to make. And I, I think uh, to answer, I, I guess the, the, to answer your question, why we do this, I suspect it's because we want to be able to quantify the success of treatment. So we want to have an outcome that is quantifiable and say, okay, this is the, the good thing that happens and we're aiming for, this is the bad thing that we're trying to fix. But, uh, we have to be careful in how, how we define uh, good and bad resilience susceptibility because it, it really depends uh, on, on the measure and on the circumstance under which we define them. But I agree with you, yes, the best approach would be to have uh, a uh, kind of like a, a data-driven uh, approach that is not, is not uh, pre-classified uh, to, to begin with. Yeah. So, so in general, your resilient mice seem to be the more careful ones. They are not really the, they are more anxious. They, they actually seek more social interaction after they have been exposed to stress. They are the, 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 the passive, um, how did you call them? Passive? The passive solvers. The passive solvers. So it almost seems like they are just they are just kind of more more careful in their behavior. They don't seem necessarily more competent, but more careful. Would you agree, or is that not a um, correct assessment of what you have shown us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, when I saw my um, anxiety test results and the social preference before stress exposure. Uh, it, it is mice that seem to be uh, less interested in social targets, uh, kind of like avoiding avoiding uh, potential danger. So I, I'd like to I like to joke uh, that th these are the introverted mice. Uh, and it, at first I was surprised, but then I thought, okay, perhaps uh, because they have lower social preference to begin with, for some reason they're less sensitive or uh, to social. Um, social stimuli or the, uh, the social stimuli are less salient and therefore they could be affected less by the social stress. Uh, but this is something that it remains to be determined. Yeah. Okay. Can Thank I, you very uh, much. Can I bring hmm? something up? Is it, do we have time? I, I would say we have two minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll do it shortly. I just want to bring another point uh, from uh, therapy or the mentalization part of therapy, uh, which I don't know for mice, but at least for adolescents, that those who are more cautious in their relationship 
we tend to see that they are actually doing uh, uh, a cognitive and uh, uh, a cognitive um, process, which looking and really understanding what is the situation and taking in consideration also uh, the cognitive and their mental situation before they're taking a step, uh, meaning that they are actually operating their uh, uh, um, 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 symbol system uh, and also the implicit system together before they're taking a step. So maybe in terms of the mice, I don't know, but also in adolescents, those who are uh, cautious um, are operating more um, uh, complex system uh, before they're doing such uh, things. And maybe also this is part of uh, what is influencing, influencing their brain uh, while they're um, taking such steps. I don't know if I was clear, I was trying to do it very fast. No, absolutely. 